Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's a journey to the end of all the streets in the world. You turn a corner and you're there. You walk more slowly and lean your heart against it like you were in church until it explodes in your face. Then you move swiftly and you're one of the crowd window shopping for kicks and bargains and heartbreak. And you'll find it. Because it's Broadway, my beat. The side streets are furious where they funnel off of Broadway. Then they trail down into limbo. Midway between the Fury and Limbo is a gray stone building. That's police headquarters. That's where I was standing, in front of it, watching the patches of night sky bleed into each other. That was my detail. I was waiting for someone. Ah, hi, Danny. Oh, Sergeant Ellis. How are things upstate? Oh, great. You know Officer Quinn, don't you? He drove Tommy and me down. Sure. How are you, Quinn? Yeah, fine, Lieutenant. Why don't you pull up in the parking area over there? We'll meet you in the squadron for coffee a little later. Sure thing. Well, why don't somebody ask me how I am? I served half my sentence. That makes me a semi-approved citizen, don't it? You look okay to me, Tommy. Haven't changed since you were 16. <laughs> Danny, I've known you a long time. You lie. Sing Sing doesn't agree with you. Uh, it's Sing Sing. You inhale and exhale. It's the only way you know you're living. So, I make a deal. What kind of a deal, Tommy? I don't know. I'm saving it for the D.A. After we talk, the D.A. and me, I got a feeling the state's going to forget all about my manslaughter rap and let me out of Sing Sing for good. Uh-huh. And to you, uh-huh, too. <laughs> Look, kid, when I finish spilling, some of the choicest names in the choicest circles are going to be doing things they never thought they could do before, like getting sentenced, like, like breaking rocks, like making license plates for automobiles. Ah, like uh, stash it, Tommy. Here, Lieutenant, I'll take off these cuffs between Tommy and me. There you are, Danny. Tommy's your prisoner. And Danny, the car! Tommy, don't be a fool. Come back here. Let's get him, Ellis. Ellis. <gasps> Danny! <laughs> Ellis. Oh, no. I just got two parts in the car and I heard... What happened? Quinn, go upstairs and put Tommy Manon's description on the wire. I want the whole city dragged from him, and I want him found. And I want him brought to me. Do that, Quinn. Sure, but how about... How about what? Sergeant Ellis. He's dead, isn't he? Dead. Dead. Death and violence are easy commodities in the city. Easy to buy and easy to sell. A decent man named Gordon Ellis got his free for nothing. The sudden mob that gathered around his shrunken body got theirs at bargain prices, too. Headlines on the house. Criminal escapes. Cop murdered. And the sick taste was in my mouth. I just stood while the headquarter boys did what needed to be done. Then I went back to my office and locked the door. Waited until the sickness was gone. Danny! Danny! Yeah, yeah. What do you want? Oh, just to talk to you. Can't I talk to you, Danny? Yeah, come on in, sir. <clears throat> uh, it was messy what happened out there, Danny. You selling something, Tartaglia? Uh, don't, don't talk to me that way, Danny. You, it hurts. So it hurts, and I bleed for you. Oh, Danny, that's not your mouth that says things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Apologies are also not necessary. What happened could have happened to anyone, not just you. I was clumsy. I was clumsy, and a man's life dropped out of my hands. Tartaglia, get me the file on Tommy Manon. Everything. Even the dust it's wrapped in. Okay, Danny. Okay, in a minute. 
You know, the way I figure it, this deal that Tommy Manning wanted to make with the DA, well, maybe it was kosher and maybe it was crummy. Maybe this whole this, thing... You're still here, Todd Taglio. Danny, Danny, darling. I've brought you your posy. You can't face the world without a posy. Bend down so I can pin it on you. Janie, how many times I have to tell you it ain't dignified you should sell flowers in police headquarters and without a license? You're only a Sergeant Tart Tagler. You will address me as Madam. Stop squirming, Danny. <laughs> All right, Janie. Tell me, doll, they, are you still running competition with the post office? Keep your nose to the smell in the flowers, Danny. It's healthier. The boys and the lamb, do they still send messages to their loved ones through old Janie, the subway Lily? Like Tommy Mann and maybe? Danny, darling. I'd rather be called Lily than be planted with one. So I'm not saying one way or the other. Yeah. Pay the lady for the posy, Tartaglia. Outside of headquarters and across the rooftops and down in the roaring avenues, the city had already grown restless for the nighttime. It was a time of big noise and prowling and secret laughter. And somewhere inside of it and part of it, Tommy Mannon, hoodlum. Tommy Mannon, hoodlum. And I was living this piece of my life just for him. So I was prowling too. And there was a place to go. A white marble house that overlooked the East River. It was on the other side of a world. A precise pattern of house lights strung like tinsel against the dark. The precise butler who opened the door and tilted his finger at the precise angle toward the waiting room. The decor of opulence that makes its own particular breed. And the precise amount of time that went by before the greeting from mine host. Danny Clover. How nice. Won't you join us? We're in the library. <laughs> Danny, this is a surprise and a pleasant one. Oh, uh, you know Mr. Arnold, don't you? James Arnold, the attorney. Uh, Hello, Danny. What brings you all the way out here, Danny? I thought you'd be expecting me. I didn't know you were having company, Faulkner. I'll leave. Just stay a while, Arnold. Thank you, Danny. I was about to suggest the same thing. Now, why have I the honor? Had any other visitor lately, like, like Tommy Mannon? Why should he come here? He's a wandering boy. You might be keeping a light in the window for him. Tommy left my employ when he confessed to manslaughter. Uh, really, Faulkner, maybe I'd better leave. You're comfortable, Arnold? The uh, drinks are all right? The uh, order? Fine, but... Then stay a while. Sit. Faulkner, when Tommy was brought back to New York, it was because he was going to turn state's evidence against some of the... Choicest names, he said. So? You're a choice name. You and Arnold here, respectively an untouchable high-class hoodlum. The attorney for an untouchable high-class hoodlum. Real choice names. Thank the police, Lieutenant Arnold. <laughs> We're choice. He said so. Go ahead. Thank him. My... Uh, not that way, attorney mine. Thank him. Thanks. <laughs> That's better. Go ahead, Danny. I think your gunsel shot down a policeman and helped Tommy escape. But such a tactic would constitute a felony, Danny. I think that Tommy's being brought to town was a dodge. Tommy had powerful friends on the outside who knew when he would be brought down. So you suggest we arrange this afternoon's fiasco? I'm suggesting it. Oh, throw it away. It ruins a good evening. It lends a, a bilious overtone to the fine conversation Arnold and I were having. Uh, doesn't it, Arnold? Yes, it makes conversation bilious. Exactly. I was explaining to Arnold the uh, seven-move mate that won Konstantinov the chess championship in 32. Things like that devastate me. Don't they you, Danny? You leave men like Faulkner in his toady and you have a feeling you've been playing mumble peg with scalpels. Then you take a long walk into a dismal and frayed edge of the city and it's a walk back into memory. The street where you were born is the same. The kids' games are the same. The cruel words on their mouths are not changed. The fly-specked electric bulbs that hang in peeling hallways are still there. And the night sounds of a tenement still follow you as you climb the decaying stairs. Then you knock on a door that opens into a room where Tommy Mannon was born. Too late. What do you want? Mrs. Mann. I might be. You're peddling something. It's late and you've come to the wrong place. Wait, I just want to talk to you. Don't you remember me, Mrs. Mann? I stopped remembering a long time ago. I'm Danny Clover. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Face is cleaner than when I saw you last. How old were you, Danny? Ten? It won't take long. Could we step inside? We can talk here. Inside would be better, Mrs. Man. All right. Go on in. Who is it, Mrs. Manning? Who's your gentleman caller, Mrs. Manning? Hello, Mr. Manning. Hmm? Oh, I know you. You're, you're, you're Danny. Danny Culver. You're the cop who let my boy get away. <laughs> have a drink, Danny. You've been wonderful to my boy. Come on, Danny, have a drink. No, don't mind him, Danny. Danny. He means no harm. He's a drunken sot that he don't mean no harm. Go back to your bottle, Mr. Manning. <laughs> I'll do that thing, dearie. I'll just do that. You want to know if Tommy's been here, don't you? Has he? When you were a kid, did you ever hear it said Mrs. Manning was a liar? No. Then you'll believe me when I tell you this. If Tommy so much as put foot in this house, I'd throw him back into the gutter he wallows in. That's no way to talk about Tommy. Tommy's good. Tommy's smart. Smart. I drink to my boy, Tommy. Then maybe you'll get a word to your smart boy, Mr. Miller. Tell him we want him. Tell him we want him bad enough to hurt him. Good night, Mrs. Miller. I went back to Broadway for only one reason. I was hungry. And eating alone is the loneliest time a man can have. On Broadway, there's always people. You can watch them and make up your own stories. Stories that didn't have murder in it. I dawdled over spot nuts and coffee, made up my stories, then hit the street again. Part of it hit back at me, and it had the smell of lavender and a bit of old Irish lace in it. Danny! Danny Clover! Why, Janie, have you been following me? The post office business is blooming, Danny. Here's a posy for you. <laughs> You've already pinned one on me today, remember? Ah, but this is a very special posy. Here, take it. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. I've always wanted a cornflower. I got it from a florist who says he's a dear friend of yours. Thank him for me. You think him, Danny. He doesn't live too far from here. You could get a cab. 2620 West 10th Street. First floor back. Oh? For whom do I ask? Ask for Tommy. Go quickly, Danny, dear, and ask for Tommy Mannon. Tenth Street was a quarter of an hour away, and number 2620 was a hole in a block long of piled red bricks. First floor, walk back, and you know when you've come to the end of the hall when you can't quite walk through the final shadow. Tommy. Tommy Mannon. Open up, Tommy. It's Danny Clover. There was Tommy Mannon, all right. But his status had changed. He wasn't running anymore. He was seated in a wooden chair in front of a wooden table, peeping almost slyly over a bowl of waxed fruit. I walked over to him, put my hand on his shoulder. Yeah, it was Tommy Mannon, all right. And his status had really changed. He wasn't living anymore. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. At nine o'clock in the morning, Broadway is a five minute stopover for a million people. For these people, it's the five minutes that are important. It gives them time to adjust themselves to the world. It's assuring. Translux assures them that there's been a change in the weather. And the headlines will show them that the daily murder has taken place. Tabloids yelled cop killing. There was a piece in the item about me, continued on page 23. On page 23, it said that I was standing right there when Officer Ellis was killed. I didn't know who did it. In my office at headquarters, a police sergeant named Tartaglia had a word for it. Hmm. Do you mind repeating that, Tartaglia? Huh? Never mind. You got the date I asked for? Oh, sure, Danny. Okay, brief it to me. Yeah, Danny, yeah. On June 17, 1944, Tommy Mannon confessed to beating up and killing one John Westfall. Uh -huh. This was what is known as the aftermath of a drunken brawl. Mannon was convicted of manslaughter. End of brief. 
Uh, real brief, huh? Yeah, it ran about like that. And the other thing, Tartaglia, about the newspapers, you fix that? Oh, yeah, I fixed it, Danny. Like you said, not a word to the newspapers about finding Tommy Mannon dead or alive. Uh, especially dead. Okay. The coroner's report? Yeah, yeah, I briefed that, too. Like this. Tommy Mannon was dead on arrival. Not a mark on his body. He wasn't poisoned. No heart failure. Mysterious, huh? Tartaglia. Okay, okay. Tommy Mannon was drowned. Drowned? So it says on the report. Mannon was, and I quote, forcibly held with his head underwater until he was drowned. And I unquote. Yeah, they figure it was in that fruit bowl on the table. Water was still clean to the wax fruit. Twist, huh? Yeah, funny killer. You got that list of character witnesses at Mannon's trial? Yeah, yeah, there was one. And the one was one Georgia Webb. Address, the Brighton Hotel for Women. Brighton Hotel for Women, huh? That's uh, quite a show place. Uh, Danny... Uh Uh-uh. This one I'll brief for myself. The Brighton Hotel for Women stands at the edge of the park. From its blood granite threshold, you can watch the old men playing at bowls on the green. Through its plate glass doors, you look in on a pink plush world. A world of plaster cupids and crystal chandeliers with electric candles. And mirrors. The reflection of mirrors. The room clerk is a crone in taffeta and tobacco-stained fingers who points you to a satin-tufted elevator. And the fifth floor is a hallway lighted with rails of fluorescent lamps. Some doors stood open. Georgia Webb's was closed. Come in, come in, whatever you are. Georgia Webb? Mm hmm. Whatever you are, it's nice in here. Today they're good to me. Who? God, whispers, whatever it is that brought you to me. Come in, sit down, pour yourself a drink. And maybe you don't drink. I'm Danny Clover. You didn't have to tell me that. What's in the name, as they say? I'm Danny Clover, Broadway special detail. Oh? Off duty? No, Georgia. I take it all back. Everything I've said, I take it all back. I've been catching up on my reading. Only today I read where you were once Tommy Mannon's girl. Tommy Mannon? Yeah, a punk who ran away. I thought maybe you ran here so he'd refresh your memory, so you'd remember his name. Tommy Mannon. If I knew him, it didn't make an impression. You know, there are men like that. You testified at his trial. You gave your name, your address, and your testimony in a loud, clear voice. Clear enough and loud enough for me to hear five years later. It's true. Your ears are cute. Maybe you left something out five years ago, Georgia. Something you'd like to tell me now. About Manon? Was it Tommy Manon? Tommy Manon. Why don't you ask him when you find him? I found him. That's why I'm asking you. Because Tommy was dead. Oh? How'd he die? Natural causes, or did you shoot him because you're a policeman and you can kill people? Someone pushed his head in the bowl of water and Tommy Mannon was drowned. That's how he died. Oh? We don't like the way he died, because it could happen to other people. Like you, maybe. Could, couldn't it? So maybe now you'll remember some things that Tommy didn't get to tell us. Yeah. There are better ways of dying. You know, it's convincing how you talk. Tommy was a jerk, a jerk who made deals. Everything was a deal. Even the man thought of that. Explain it to me. Tommy didn't kill that man. He was in Baltimore when it happened. But he confessed to it. For $20,000, he confessed to it. He gave five years of his life for $20,000. <laughs> Tommy, the deal maker. The poor crumb. Why doesn't somebody answer that phone? They will. Let's go over it again, Georgia. You're saying a man was killed, that it was all a frame. Who made the deal with Tommy? For you, dearie. All right. I'll only be a minute, Danny. Okay. This is Georgia. Yeah. Wait a minute. All right. All right, yes. Yeah. You can go now, policeman. Your time's up. What? Get out. Everything I told you was a lie. All the talk I made, it was no good. That phone call have anything to do with it? Yes. You ask me and I tell you yes. They told you not to talk anymore. Who told you that? A man who likes it when people are dead. Now you understand why I've got nothing to say to you. You understand nothing you can do or think of can make me talk to you. Yeah. 
That's how it is, Danny boy. And that's how it was. She really meant it. It was noon when I left the Brighton Hotel for women. I told myself I could think better if I walked. When the walk was over, I might as well have taken a cab. Nothing came. No answers to anything. No progress. Except that I was back at headquarters. In the first floor hallway, there's a bulletin board listing sheriff sales, police details, and used radios at a bargain. There was a man looking at it. He saw me and moved his lips over his teeth. This was supposed to mean he was smiling, which was supposed to mean he was glad to see me. Hello, Lieutenant. Remember me? James Arnold, isn't it? Faulkner's attorney. Yes, Faulkner's my client. You mean you work for him? You're his flunky. Mr. Clover, I work for many people. My association with Faulkner is neither more nor less intimate than my association with my other clients. Understand, I work, work for, for many people. people. You've been wondering what I'm doing at police headquarters? I'll be frank with you. I haven't given you a thought. I know. That's how I affect people. Can we talk? Aren't we? Of course. I mean in private. This is private. Of course. So talk. Of course. Good things could happen to you, Lieutenant. Every night, Mr. Arnold. Every night, I say. Let good things happen to me. Now you know a secret. Fine things, Lieutenant. Like silks and satins, like me. People are interested in you and want the best for you. People want that. What people? People. Nice people who want to see you get along. Mind if I interrupt? Of course, interrupt. It's about Tommy Manon, isn't it? Of course. Now, go on. It isn't much. The nice people don't know what happened to Tommy. They don't want to know. They want this case closed as if Tommy were... Dead? Dead. They want this case closed. You can arrange it. Then nice things will happen to you. I'll try, Mr. Arnold. I really will. Splendid, Lieutenant. The nice people will be happy. You too. Goodbye, Mr. Clough. Yeah. Tartaglia. Uh, uh, yeah, Danny. Send out a pickup for Georgia Webb. Brighton Hotel for women. Pick her up and bring her down. Item two? Call the press room and give them the whole story on Tommy Manon. Tell them we found him dead, drowned, everything, the works. Yeah, Danny. Tell them this. Tell them we've got a witness who confessed everything. Named Georgia Webb. She talked her head off. Got that? Yeah. Then do it. Okay, Danny. Uh, where are you going? Home, Tartaglia. Home. I'm going to sleep. When I got home, the landlady had left two things for me. A bowl of matzo ball soup and a manila envelope. They both looked inviting, so I tried the envelope first. Five thousand dollars. The nice thing that Arnold had promised would happen to me came so fast to such a nice round sum. What more could a man want out of life? Five thousand dollars in a dish of matzo balls. I ate the soup, kissed the landlady, put the five thousand dollars in an envelope addressed to the D.A., pulled a chair over to the window and sat there, watching the city burst into fragments of electric flame. I must have sat there a long time, because when I awoke, the night had a new shadow. The shadow of a man named Faulkner. I brought you the morning paper, Danny. They got your name all over it, splashed in red ink. Oh, I knew I'd make it someday. Thanks, Faulkner. Here's a nickel for your trouble. Red ink could be blood in the later editions, Danny. Oh, a rotten place to sleep. A chair. Like some coffee? You can think better if you have coffee. And light. They tell me you're a man of virtue, Clover. Gratitude's a virtue. So whoever told me lied. It hurts you whenever people lie to you? It hurts me when a man of virtue's ungrateful. You shouldn't have booked Georgia Webb. You shouldn't have made a talk. You shouldn't have taken my $5,000. I've been naughty, haven't I? I have one question for you, Detective Mine. One little question. Your gun gives me three chances, I'll guess, in one. You want to know what Georgia told me? Possibly. Possibly it doesn't matter. But tell me anyway. You're bluffing, Faulkner. Your act is precious, is that the word? But you're bluffing. You're scared to death. So? Tell me why. Explicitly. Because your life depends on Georgia. Only... I've got her tucked away where you can't touch her. Explicit, huh? Put away the artillery, Faulkner. It'd be deemed ungracious for guests. Come in. 
Hello, Denton. Oh, you already have a visitor. It's your counselor, Faulkner. Happy day. Come in, Arnold. But now I don't have to come in. You already know what I came to tell you. Tell me anyway. I only that Faulkner is your man, the man who killed the policeman, the man who killed Tommy Mannon. Are you insane, Arnold? Watch him, Danny. He's dangerous. Are you double crossed? I told you he was dangerous, Dan. He would have killed us all. Yeah, you shot him good the first time, Arnold. Why did you waste another bullet? Come on, let's take a walk to headquarters. Is it necessary? Yeah, it's necessary. I want to straighten out the records. Please. No jokes. Okay, no jokes. I'll be real sincere. Tommy Mannon took your rap, Arnold. You were the one who committed the manslaughter. Faulkner supplied a pigeon for you. Pigeon, one of his hoodlums, Tommy Mannon. May I smoke? Sure. Faulkner had to supply a pigeon because you knew all about Faulkner's operations. He was supposed to pay Tommy 20000 for taking the rap. But Faulkner's lying on the floor over there. He's dead. You'll need proof of all this. That's proof enough. You shot Faulkner in cold blood so that he'd never talk. To go on. When Tommy was transferred to New York, Faulkner went gunning for him so Tommy wouldn't talk. Only he missed and shot the wrong man. He killed a cop instead of Tommy. How does all this theorizing concern me? When you boys finally caught up to Tommy, you drowned him in a fruit bowl. Let's go, Arnold. I'm going to book you for the murder of Tommy Mannon. You forgot something, Danny. I've still got my gun. I hadn't forgotten was the chance I took. Arnold had already used two shots on Faulkner. I had to get him to throw away the other four. All the while I'd been talking to him, I'd been edging toward the light switch. Now I flipped it. One. I'll kill you, Faulkner. I had one advantage. I knew the apartment. Arnold didn't. The blackness, he could only fire at sound. I swapped an ashtray off the table. Two. I picked up a book, heaved it at the window. Three. Huh. One more. I grabbed a chair and threw. Four. <laughs> okay, Arnold, like I said, let's get you booked for murder. <laughs> out in front of you, livid scars slashed into the night. It's a cruel and fantastic carousel, a palace of fun, a hall of mirrors. You pay your way and you take your choice. Me, I get in on the pass. I'm the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was conducted by Wilbur Hatch and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Jane Morgan, Peggy Weber, Doris Singleton, Charles Calvert, Joe Kearns, Herb Butterfield, and Sidney Miller. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.